All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator at Murder by the Book in Houston. And we're so excited tonight to have Philip Margolin with us. Um, and he's going to be in conversation with Keith Kayla, who is his editor. So we're really excited to bring you kind of a little bit of a different uh, virtual event that's just not McKenna and I talking with the author. We're excited to get a different perspective, um, especially since a lot of times we get questions um, in the comments about um, an author's relationship with their editor and what editors do. So we're really excited for that. But before I bring them out, I wanted to make just a couple of quick announcements. First up, um, if you see any um, comments that come up that say anything like, oh, to watch this event, click here. Don't click on those, those are spam. You're already watching the event. You don't have to go to another website and put in your credit card information to watch. You're already watching it. It's free here on Facebook and on YouTube. I wanted to mention that if you have questions for Keith or Philip, you can put those in the comments either on Facebook or YouTube, and we will be getting to those in a little bit. We've got a lot of great stuff coming up. Uh, last night, we were able to chat with Harlan Coben about his newest book um, with, uh, Michael J. Fox, so we'll be uploading that to the YouTube channel uh, really soon. And we're excited that in early April, we are working with um, the publishers Agora and Polis to do an event with five of their authors, so definitely check that out. Um, we've got Adele Parks and Lisa Jewell coming up, so really good full roster of things coming up. Uh, McKenna was counting it up today. We have hosted over 200 author events with over 300 authors since the pandemic started about a year ago. So there's a little bit of something for everybody on the store's YouTube channel. So definitely check those out. Um, so I think that's everything that I wanted to kind of generally let you guys know about. So we're gonna get into it. We're really excited tonight to have Phil Margolin with us. And how are you tonight? I am great. I'm enjoying myself. This is really a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it's you know, we definitely miss having people in the store, but it's been really cool to be able to kind of do some unconventional stuff like this or be able to pair up authors that we wouldn't necessarily be able to get together if they were in the store. So we're excited to do this this evening. Uh, for everybody watching, um, Philip has written over 20 novels, most of them New York Times bestsellers, including Gone But Not Forgotten, Lost Lake and Violent Crimes. In addition to being a novelist, he was a longtime criminal defense attorney with decades of trial experience, including a large number of capital cases, and he lives in Portland, Oregon. Um, tonight, he's gonna be talking about the newest book in the Robin Lockwood series, which is A Matter of Life and Death. And we're gonna be joined by his editor, Keith Kayla. How are you tonight, Keith? I'm doing fine. It's good to see you. Thanks for doing this with us. Yeah, glad it's fun to do it. So some of you guys who um, have been to the store before might recognize Keith. He has visited um, when Greg Hurwitz has come. So he is no stranger to Murder by the Book. We're so excited to have him on board with us this evening. Um, he is the executive editor for Minotaur Books at St. Martin's Press, where he has worked for the past three decades. He is Texan born and bred, but now lives in New York City, where it is impossible to get decent chicken fried steak or even passable Tex-Mex. I've heard that I have a friend that moved, um, one of my best friends moved up to New York, I don't know, like five years ago. And every time he comes back, he wants Tex-Mex for every meal because it's just not the same. It's true. But then again, Texas can't make a decent bagel. <laughs> awesome. So as I mentioned, um, anybody who is watching in the out there on the crowd on Facebook and YouTube, if you have questions for, for these guys, you can definitely post those in the comments. I'm going to turn off my camera and let them get to chatting, and I will see you guys in a little bit. So, so Phil, I have got a bunch of questions from uh, myself, and um, Jennifer Welch, your agent, decided to chip in a few. So uh, you're, you've really got to be on the spot here. But the let's sort of the one thing I'm worried about. Are you going to edit all of my answers? Um, oh, I wish I could, but if we're doing this live. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so um, a matter of life and death is the fourth book, as you said, in the Robin Lockwood series. So the lead character, Robin Lockwood, is a late twenties former MMA fighter and current defense attorney. Now. From my experience, you're a long way from a woman in her 20s, and I'm going to guess you've never really done any MMA fighting on your own. What led you to create a character like this? Well, actually, Keith, I wrestled all through college, and I did karate for five years, so I've actually uh, done some of the stuff. Uh, but the reason I did that, a, a lot of my books have very strong women characters in the lead. And uh, they frequently will get in dangerous situations. 
And in real life, um, if there was a, you know, a head-to-head fight between a man and a woman, the odds are that the guy's going to win because of upper body strength and a bunch of other things. So I was trying to think if Robin got into a dangerous situation, how could I make a fight between her where she would beat a man realistic? And I thought, okay, um, I'm going to give her a backstory. And the backstory is that when she was growing up, she grew up in a Midwestern town, and her older brothers were all wrestlers, champion wrestlers. And so when she went to high school, she wanted to be a wrestler, but the, a lot of the parents objected to a girl being on the boys' wrestling team, and the school board said she couldn't do it. So her dad hired an attorney to represent her, and they sued the school board, and they won. And that's what made her decide that she wanted to be a lawyer because she saw what a lawyer could do for somebody. So she did get to wrestle, but when she, uh, and she actually placed, she's the first uh, uh, girl to place in the boys district championships, she came in third. But when she went to college, she went to a division one school that had a top wrestling program. She knew there was no way she would be able to make the team, but there was a gym nearby where they had uh, mixed martial arts. So she started practicing mixed martial arts and was pretty good at it. And uh, when the, uh, uh, by the time she graduated from college, she was ranked seventh nationally and used to compete on uh, uh, pay-per-view fights in Las Vegas. So, uh, and then in her first year at Yale Law School, because she's not only a good uh, MMA fighter, but she's also super smart. So Yale is one of the top law schools in the country, very hard to get into, but she got in. Uh, and in her first uh, semester, against the advice of her manager, she, she took a fight with the number two um, uh, ranked fighter in the, in, the, in the world and not only got a concussion, but short-term memory loss. So <laughs> she decided at that point she would suspend her professional fighting career and concentrate on law school. So that's, that's sort of her backstory. And it, again, I did it. She does get into occasional actual fights with men, men in the book and is able to beat them. A lot of times it's because they don't expect her to know how to fight, but I wanted it to be a realist, you know, something that's realistic as opposed to someone say, Oh, well that, you know, that couldn't happen. So now most of your books you've written um, and we're up coming up on the 25th one pretty soon. Um, are standalones. So how is it different writing a character, a series character, than it is from the standalones that you're, you've been used to doing more of? I actually, I count them up, and I think we're, they're pretty balanced now. I think half the books are in series. Uh, I have three series, and half the books are standalones. Uh, <clears throat> I try to actually write, and I've been really happy about this when I look at reviews on uh, uh, Amazon or whatever, a lot of the times the people are reviewing the book will say, this is the fourth book in the series, but you don't have to read the other books in this series because it, it reads like a standalone. And I go out of my way to do that because I get really upset if I start reading a new author or someone I haven't read and I, oh, this looks interesting. And it's number four in the series and I have no, no idea what the hell's going on because it's all these people or situations that I've never heard of and don't know anything about. So I go out of my way to um, write the books as if it was not a series. And it really took me a long time to write a series because uh, my third book, Gone But Not Forgotten, was a huge international bestseller. And my gut reaction when I was deciding, you know, what should I do next was, well, I'll write another Betsy Tannenbaum serial killer book. Uh, because the first one was so popular. But then I thought about Arthur Conan Doyle, and mm -hmm. he hated Sherlock Holmes because he really wanted to write historical novels, and if he wrote something that didn't have Sherlock in it, everyone would start screaming at him, and they wouldn't read the book, and they say, what are you going to do with Sherlock? So I got really scared that if I wrote a series and then I wanted to do something else, uh, people would get mad at me and they wouldn't read it. So I intentionally wrote 
After Dark, which was the, the book right after, completely different book, no continuing characters, had a, more murders and, and more twists than gone, but was different, you know, a whole different uh, feel. And then the, I constantly did standalones that were very different from the book that went before. Uh, and then I wrote Wild Justice was my seventh book, and that introduced Amanda Jaffe. Right. I so the next book was a standalone, uh, and, and Wild Justice was supposed to be a standalone. Then I wrote The Associate, and the, the lead guy is a young lawyer who uh, is the, at the bottom of the totem pole in a big firm and gets framed for murder. He has to have a defense lawyer, so I was going to make one up. And then I said, well, I'd like to man it from the previous book, so I'll just make her have a cameo role. And then the next one, Ties It Bind, I wrote the outline for that book, and the Jaffees were not in it. Amanda and Frank, they're a father-daughter criminal defense team. They weren't in it, but then when I finished the outline, I said, well, they, they would fit in here. And I've never continued the life of a character from one book to the next. And I said, I wonder if I could do that. So that was the second book in the Amanda Jaffe series. So uh, then I went back and wrote a bunch of standalones and interspersed them with the Dana Cutler series. So now it's like whatever, if I've got an idea for a standalone, I'll do that. But I really am enjoying the Robin Lockwood series. It's, it's a lot of fun. And I tried to make each one of those completely different also, except instead of having to invite, invent uh, a new investigator, a new lawyer, I, I put Robin and, and various people in, in, that are in the previous books in. And speaking of Amanda Jaffe, she makes an appearance in you know, a matter of life and death. Yeah, I wanted to do that. I thought that would be sort of fun. You have to, if you do a death penalty case, you have to have two lawyers. It's, it's an ethics rule in Oregon. I don't know if that's true in other states, but, but any time I did a death penalty case, I was required to have a backup. And you really need second chair, someone to tell you, like an editor, you're screwing up. I mean, that's your, your job as an editor is to take a look at my brilliant prose that's, that is the most amazing stuff ever and say, uh, Phil, it is amazing, but. <laughs> so, so you need a guy, you need someone who's second chair so that if you get a stupid idea, someone can hit you over the head with a law book and tell you, hey, you know, that's not as good an idea, but it might lead to your client being killed. So don't do that. So uh, you have to have a second chair and, uh, in a matter of life and death, I, one of the things I've tried to do without lecturing, it's a thriller with a surprise ending and stuff, but it's to show what happens in the death penalty case because they're completely different from any other kind of, of criminal or civil case, uh, even different from regular murder cases where there's no death penalty. So I tried to show what a death penalty, how a death penalty case is handled, and I needed a second chair for Robin. And I said, oh, I like Amanda Jaffe. I'll just put her in the book. Now, I mean, do they decide before the case goes uh, to trial whether it will be a death penalty case or not? Or is that only the penalty phase? The, the prosecutor is the one who charges the case as an aggravated murder case. There's only a certain type of, of murder that... Uh, qualifies for the death penalty. And it's, they're listed in the statute what what types of, of murder. You know, it's like if you kill a police officer or if there's torture, if I forget you know, what the different categories are. So it's up to the prosecutor when they are indicting to decide, am I going to charge this guy so he can get the death penalty or am, am I just going to go for life in prison? Um, so once... Once the indictment comes down, either it qualifies as an aggravated murder case or it doesn't. Uh, all right, so sort of stepping back from this particular book just a little bit, you're a lawyer who writes thrillers that frequently involve the legal system. So what do you think most crime writers get wrong when they write about the legal system? Um, well, it's just not at all like, I mean, <laughs> I represented hundreds of people over a 25 year career. And I, I have to say probably 90% or more were actually guilty of the crime they were charged with. 
uh, the police usually get it right. And uh, on TV, everybody's innocent. You know, <laughs> nobody's, nobody's guilty. Perry Mason, I think, had one guilty client in all the years that he was on TV and in the books. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is <clears throat> that the real life murder cases are so different from the books. I mean, in real life, unfortunately, you don't have six people who might have committed the crime and then you get them into a library at the end of the trial and you point out through clues who did it. It's usually a guy who went in a bar and he got drunk and he got an argument about who the better basketball team was, the Blazers or the Lakers, and he took a knife out and stabbed some guy and there's 25 witnesses and he feels bad and confesses. And there's no love interest there like you, you have in the book. So uh, the other thing is these, these I, I've done like two month trials and they they can be, uh, they're fascinating for the lawyer because there are all these interesting legal issues. But I've done like major federal drug conspiracy cases that lasted months. And a lot of the times you want to shoot yourself in the head because the witness is a guy from the telephone company who's on for two straight days going through the phone logs. So it's not like, you know, this exciting stuff that you have when you're reading a book or, uh, or you're watching a movie. So it's, it's like I say, for the lawyer, there's, there's legal issues, emotions. So that keeps you interested. And, but it, it isn't at all like what you have on TV. Wow. See, I was actually on grand jury in, or I was actually on a uh, jury in uh, Brooklyn, criminal case. And it was much more exciting than it, than, than it sounds like your trials are, you know. <laughs> well, some you of them are really exciting trials. I mean, I've had, of the 30 murder cases I handled, two of the cases involved people who had been convicted of um, murder and sentenced to life in prison with another, with, with another lawyer. And then I was hired to handle the appeal. And to my horror, I discovered that both these guys were factually completely innocent, nothing to do with the with the crime. And those are really exciting. And I very, uh, you know, I mean, you, you really don't sleep a lot in that type of situation. My favorite case is one where the guy's unquestionably guilty. They have videotapes of robbing the bank. He's confessed. Because if you win the case, everyone thinks you're brilliant. And if you lose it, eh, the guy did it anyway. <laughs> You know, most people think that every lawyer wants to represent an innocent person, and that is 100% wrong. You, I hate you representing innocent people because the consequences, if you're not perfect, are horrible. And it took me four years in both of those cases to get the guys out. We had to go through trials. Uh, they were very exciting trials, too, unfortunately. I don't like exciting trials. Like boring. <laughs> but, uh, so I have had some very – I I pioneered the uh, – the battered women syndrome defense in Oregon, where one of my specialties was representing battered women who killed abusive spouses. And no one had used that defense. 1979 is when they did. No one had used that in Portland. And I sort of revolutionized the way the district attorney's offices and judges uh, view domestic violence cases. So those, you know, were pretty exciting. But a lot of my cases, if it was on TV, you would have turned it off after about five minutes. <laughs> so sort of switching a little bit, in uh, the first three books in particular, Alzheimer's was a major thread, particularly in the first book. So what interested you in writing about Alzheimer's and memory in terms of uh, the legal you know, situation and the lead character? Yeah, what happened was there was a, a really interesting article. One of the ways I've kept up on uh, the legal profession and and changes in it uh, is by continuing to subscribe to law journals. The Oregon State Bar Journal and National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers has a, a magazine called The Champion. And one of the uh, article, there was an article in the Oregon State Bar Journal, what do you do when the senior partner in your firm, who's the big rainmaker, former president of the Oregon State Bar, starts to show diminishing capacity. And it's a really difficult situation because here's a guy who's extremely bright. Uh, he's very important to the firm. He brings in a lot of business, but it's starting to get obvious that he's losing it. 
And that gave me the inspiration for writing um, Third Victim, which uh, involves a serial killer and, and a series of murders. But um, the main, one of the main characters is Regina Barrister, the most brilliant lawyer in the criminal bar. It's called the sorceress because she wins cases that no one can win. And Robin Lockwood is just thrilled when she becomes an associate at the firm. But as they're trying this death penalty murder case where a senior partner in a law firm is uh, being charged with being a serial killer, she begins to notice that uh, Regina is, is not functioning 100%. So I, I thought that'd be a really eth tremendous ethical dilemma to give the main character, Robin, what do you do? You're, you're just a fresh out of law school. You're in your twenties. Here's the most brilliant woman in the state bar. And do you tell her you think she's losing it or do you keep your mouth shut? If you keep your mouth shut, your client could die. Uh, you know, so what do you do? And, um, I also have gone through this twice with uh, my aunt. So I've seen firsthand the progression from a person being really brilliant, you know, really funny and great woman going all the way through to where she was just a vegetable. And this also happened with my, uh, uh, during my first wife's um, mother-in-law went through this, the whole uh, progression. Uh, so I've seen it from beginning to end. And then, so that gave me some on, you know, firsthand contact with Alzheimer's and dementia. And then that article really just thought, wow, this is a really horrible position to put a young associate in. Uh, and I thought it would be a really, in, in addition to the, the mystery and who really did it in the, uh, in the third victim to, to add this extra layer. So that was, you know, I thought that was actually a really such a great touch to the first uh, uh, book and especially, you know, the books that followed it. Now, I know also you're a big chess player and you even have your own chess related charity. I wondered if your personal love of chess figures into how you plot and plan your books. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I used to play competitively and I sort of got burned out uh, at a certain point. But uh, chess is, is a it absolutely the best educational tool. So Chess for Success is this nonprofit that I helped form uh, back in 1992 with two other uh, people in Portland. And we're now up to I have, I have over 100 schools. We're, we're in um, uh, Title I schools, which are the poorest schools. And uh, it's ex about 4,000 kids a year that we work with. Uh, and Chess teaches you to be very objective and unemotional about your work, which you really need to do if you're a writer and a lawyer. Um, it teaches you to take time and analyze and think before you act, not just to jump in and do stuff. So as a lawyer and a writer, uh, specifically with writing, the way, the way it helps me is I have a process that I use where I get an idea so that's the beginning of all my books. But ideas are this big, they're, they're tiny. A book is this big. So I have to develop the tiny idea. Um, could the president be a serial killer? That was an executive privilege. So that's tiny. I had to develop that. And so when you do it is I start thinking, okay, if this character does this, what will happen? Oh, that could happen. Well, if that happens, what happens here? And that's like saying, if I move my knight out, uh, what, what could happen? The bishop could take it. But what if, if I move the pawn instead? So it gives you a way of, of analyzing and thinking about problems. And then the other good part of that, like I said, is uh, it teaches you not to get upset with criticism. So you as an editor, your job really is to point out where I've screwed up. And a lot of times when uh, people ask me about the relationship between an editor and a writer, and the way I always explain it is this way. If Keith, if you and I were playing a game of chess and beating you was the most important thing in my life. I've been training for five years for this match. I've 
hired Russian grandmasters to help train me. And we're in the middle of the game, and it's a crucial position, and I take an hour trying to figure out my move. And eventually I move my knight out. Now, you're looking at the, the, uh, the game from a totally different perspective. You're on the other side of the board, and you don't know what I'm thinking about. And you look over and you say, oh, I have a checkmate in three. Now, it's not that I didn't try my hardest. This was the most important thing in my life. I put everything into it, but I made a mistake. And your job as an editor is to take a look at what I've written and point out where there are problems. And my job as a writer is to objectively and unemotionally listen to what you're saying. So not to get upset and you don't think I've, everything I've written is like brilliant, is to say, oh, okay, what has Keith got to say about this? What, is there a problem? Is there something I'm not doing right? And then analyze what you're saying, not get upset about it, uh, see if, if, it may, if it's a good point, then accept it. And if it's not a good point, we have a civilized discussion. But basically, you know, the job of the editor is to point out where you've messed up as a writer, and it's the job of the writer to listen and, uh, you know, realize that you're never going to be perfect. You're always going to make mistakes. So, and I, I admire uh, you as an opponent in chess, as it were. Um, so, going back to legal thrillers, I happen to know that you're a big fan of Perry Mason. So, do you prefer the books or the Raymond Burr TV series? We won't even go to the new HBO series. Or well, the books, do you have a particular favorite? You know, I haven't read any of the books in years. Um, when I was in Element, the two, two writers, everyone says, oh, what writers formed you? And I wish I could say Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, but actually it was Ellery Queen, because I, I, when I was in elementary school, I started reading two or three books a week. And um, I devoured the Ellery Queens. I love them because they're one of the few mystery writers who has actual clues. And if you can figure out the clues, you can figure out who done it. They actually even have a challenge to the reader 90% of the way through the book where uh, Ellery says, you now have all the clues to figure out who killed Mr. Jones. So that that uh, really influenced the way I write books. I try to put clues in. Now with the Perry Mason books, that really shaped my life because when I was in the seventh grade, because of reading the Perry Masons before the TV show even existed, I decided I was going to be a criminal defense lawyer when I grew up and do murder cases. And, that was the only thing I ever wanted to do, and that's what I did for 25 years. I love the TV shows, but uh, the books influenced me. But like I said, I haven't read a Perry Mason gone in years because I, you know, I, I read all all of them when I was a kid, and uh, I have gone back and started rereading the uh, Ellery Queens, uh, Otto Penzler's uh, Mysterious Presses. I'm not sure it's mysterious, but, but Otto Penzler has this American uh, mystery classic series. So I've, I've, been, I've read five of the original uh, Ellery Queens. And uh, I probably will try to read a, a Perry Mason at some point. Because uh, uh, he's, he's got at least one of the Perry Masons in that series, too. Yeah, no, one of the things that, you know, you might remember that I imagine very few people watching this will is there was the Ellery Queen TV program when I was growing up. And one of the things that they did that I loved is they did repeat that thing of like stopping and said, okay, now you know everything. And then they go cut to commercial break and you had an entire commercial break to figure out who had killed. Uh, I never actually managed to finish, figure it out, not even yeah. once. Well, they're t they were tough. I was pretty good at it, but every he would get me every once in a while because the clues are really, really brilliant. And they, they weren't easy to suss out. So, uh, you know, it, it, it required a lot of concentration and stuff. But I loved it. I love, you know, I like puzzle solving. So. A million years ago, there was a, uh, a John Dixon car novel, I think, called The Nine Wrong Answers. Mm -hmm. And you'd think you'd figure, because that was John Dixon Carr's thing, is you'd sort of read along and try and figure it out. And so you'd get to a point and you'd think you'd have it and say, the reader might now think X, Y, Z they would be wrong. And 
the thing of it is, there was one point in it, as I vaguely remember, they said, well, as I said on page such and such, among other places, and that was his cheat, because there were no other places. I went back and reread the book. It was only at one time it was bar that clue was buried. But that's what you want to do in, in, in uh, A Matter of Life and Death. There is a clue. It is buried. But if you can figure it out, you can figure out who, who the killer is. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time setting that up so that uh, hopefully the reader will have fun and they'll spot it. But if they don't, that, that, was, uh, that was my, my fun is, is doing that. So anyway, back on the matter of life and death, since you, you back to raise that, um, illegal unsanctioned fights figure into the main story. Sort of what led you to that particular plot, plot thread and what kind of research did you have to do about these illegal fights? Uh, I didn't do any research. I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, what writer, that's what writers do. We, do we, I do a lot of research. There's a lot of stuff I, I do incredible research, on, but that was what I just... I decided I wanted to have, uh, the, the, in the book, Joe Lattimore is a homeless man who uh, was a short order cook, uh, lost his job, and he was a professional fighter at one point, not a good one, uh, just, you know, fringe, fringe guy, who'd make a couple of bucks occasionally. And he's married and has a baby and he loves them both. And they're living in a tent city uh, in Portland and he gets an offer um, from this guy that sort of just comes up to him and says, you can get 300 bucks if you'll fight in this uh, uh, no hold bar, no holds barred fight. So I just invent, I invented that. It was a good way of setting up the, the, the death penalty case that, uh, that he gets involved in where he's totally innocent and has been completely framed. And the reader knows that, but nobody else does. So. Um, no research at all. <laughs> I should have asked this question before we finished editing it. Oh, well. Wow. Um, so, actually, A Matter of Life and Death might be my favorite of the Lockwood books, though Third Victim is also a, right there in the running. So, it, But it does have my favorite plot twist, and I think you've basically, as books have gone on, I think you've gotten better and better at sort of making these plots tighter and tighter. Do you have a favorite book? Um... This or any books you've written? That I've written? Yeah. Oh, okay. I would have to, you know, yes. Um, but I have two categories. My, I think the, the best thriller I wrote uh, was Gone But Not Forgotten and then Executive Privilege. Um, I do like Third Victim. I thought that was, that was pretty good. But uh, my favorite, favorite book is Worthy Brown's Daughter which it is a historical novel. It's completely different from everything I've ever written before or since. Uh, and it was inspired by the 1853 case of Holmes versus Ford, in which the Oregon Territorial Supreme Court decided you could not have slavery in Oregon. And people, when you think about slavery, you think about Mississippi and Alabama, but actually there were over 70 slaves in uh, the Oregon Territory, which encompassed Oregon and Washington. So uh, back in the 1840s and 50s, no one knew if, if Oregon was going to go into the Union as a slave state or a free state. And a lot of people from Missouri brought their slaves to Oregon uh, when the economy went belly up. And one of them was Nathaniel, Colonel Nathaniel Ford, who was uh, very influential in Missouri, owned a lot of slaves and land, and then lost most of them when the, uh, when the economy went bad. So uh, he did what people did in those days. If you failed in one part of the U.S., you just went to the other part. And he told uh, the, Robin and Polly Holmes, uh, uh, they were his slaves and he owned their family, that if they came with him to Oregon, where you could get a free square mile of land, uh, if, if you agreed to farm it, and two, if you're married, if they came and helped him develop a farm, he'd free them. Well, they went along, they had, they had five children, and after they helped develop the farm, he reneged in part. He said you, the husband and wife could go free, but the kids, uh, since he was feeding them and clothing them when they were tiny, 
and were of no use, now that they were bigger and could work, he was going to keep them as basically indentured servants. <clears throat> and it was illegal to educate a slave in Missouri. So the Holmeses were uh, uneducated and uh, they, were, they weren't stupid, but they just didn't have any formal education. And they knew they would have to go into court to get their kids back. Uh, and somehow it's been lost to history, but uh, Ruben Boise, who became uh, Oregon Supreme Court Justice when we became a state, for some reason helped them sue uh, Ford, who was very, very influential. Uh, he was supposed to be the first judge in Oregon, actually, and was in the legislature and had a lot of clout, but Boise sued him and they eventually won, but not before one of the kids died in, in, uh, in Ford's custody. And, uh, you know, what struck me about that as a writer was I have two kids and I thought, well, what would I do if someone kidnapped my children? Everyone knew who, who kidnapped them and where they were, but because of the color of my skin, I couldn't get my kids back. So the books, uh, it, it does have a surprise ending. There's a murder case, uh, a surprise ending in the murder case at the end, but it's a literary novel more than a, a legal thriller, and it does go into very serious issues like slavery, um, dealing with the loss of a spouse. So it's, it's a lot heavier than my other books. Uh, and uh, that's the one I'm, I'm proudest of. And it took me 30 years to write. So it was, <laughs> it was a, a real labor of love that started back in the 1980s, and the book was eventually published in, two, I think it was 2014. The, uh, well, you know, you've got time. You can start working on your next 30 year labor of love. Uh, I don't think I'm going to make it. I, <laughs> I, I would be great if I did. I'd be 107 if I, <laughs> if I did it. So, are you going to still be around to edit? <laughs> uh, we shall see. Okay. Uh, anyway, you actually read more books than pretty much anyone else I know. So, I'm going to ask if you have any particular favorite writers. And if you have any book recommendations. Yeah, so uh, I, I hate getting this question because I read about two or three books a week and I tend to have like a bathtub memory when I'm reading and I'm immersed. As soon as I'm finished, it's like someone pulled the plug and I don't even remember the plot, which is good because I can reread some of the books. Uh, my favorite writers um, are Yukio Mishima, who is a Japanese writer, um, Love the Russians, uh, Dostoevsky, Melville. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Joseph Conrad is a probably, and I hate Conrad, because the son of a bitch was Polish, and he didn't write in English until he was in his 40s, so it wasn't even his native language. And I've never written one sentence as good as Joseph Conrad's worst sentence, so it makes me sort of furious. My favorite novels, and, are, and I've actually read War and Peace four times. For War and Peace, um, uh, uh, Soldier, of the, of the, uh, Soldier of the Great War by Mark Halpern. Um, and I love uh, Gentleman in Moscow by uh, Emir Tolles. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and uh, I'm sure I'm leaving something out. My favorite uh, thrillers, I don't have a favorite thriller writer, but my favorite thrillers are uh, two books by Stephen Hunter, Point of Impact and a, and a Time to Hunt. When I read Point of Impact, I said, no one will ever write a better action thriller than this. And then he wrote Time to Hunt, which is 10 times better. Um, Relic by, by Preston and Childs, which is about a, uh, a monster in the Museum of Natural History, which scared the hell out of me. Um, the original uh, Hannibal Lecter, Red Dragon, I like it much better than uh, Silence of the Lambs is, is Red Dragon with a Lady. I, I mean, it's the same book, basically. But I think Red Dragon is a perfect book. And then my all-time favorite thriller is a book no one's ever heard of, Stone City by Mitchell Smith. I think it's the warm piece of thrillers. It's about 600-plus pages. Uh, if you've ever wondered what it would be like if you went to prison, this is about a a professor at an Ivy League type school who is convicted of vehicular homicide and he's put in the worst prison in the state and there is a serial killer in the prison killing the horrible prisoners and it is a work of genius the writing is amazing but there's also um, 
all of these characters that are 100% developed. And uh, it's just uh, fantastic. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> we're at Murder by the Book. So one of the, and I can't remember who it is, but probably John might be able to remind me. One of the guys at Murder by the Book um, started a publishing company, and he was reviving out-of-print books, because Stone City never did, I don't think, that well. It was out of print. And he got the rights to it, and he asked me to write a forward. And I got scared, because I thought, you know, sometimes you read a book and say, oh, this is great, and then you reread it and say, yeah, it wasn't so good. I had to reread it to do the forward, and it was still fantastic. So uh, I don't know where you can get it, probably used bookstore. I don't know if they have it at Murder by the Book, but uh, I think it's just like a work of genius. You mentioned Herman Melville, which, of course, I have my favorite. Uh, and actually, I read a lot of Melville uh, in college and after when, there, when you have time for such things. But um, he, proving that there's no actual justice, he got one of my favorite really bad reviews no. in, in a Brooklyn newspaper. And it was on when they published, um, I believe it was uh, actually on Moby Dick. And the review read, the headline of the review read, Herman Melville Crazy. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, he's, I think he's as good as Shakespeare. And um, Billy Budd is, is my favorite of his books. I, I had a funny, I read, um, when I was, in the, I was in the Peace Corps in West Africa for two years, and they gave us this book, 300 books to read. And uh, it, it was, they really did a good job picking them out. And on the way back to the States, I started reading Moby Dick. And uh, it was my, I was in Sweden and I was supposed to fly back and my flight was canceled. So they, they this was the old, old days because they actually paid to put me up in a really nice hotel and paid me my food and everything. They don't do that anymore. And I remember it was my first time with real plumbing. And I, sitting in this big bathtub filled with hot water up to my shoulders reading Moby Dick. So I have very, <laughs> very pleasant memories of reading uh, of, Mo of Moby Dick. God, yeah. All right, so we're sort of coming to the point where we should check questions, but I had one last one for you, which is, now, I happen to know what's next for Robin Lockwood, since we're working on that now, but without any spoilers, what can you tell people is in store for Robin. Well, I'm not going to tell the big twist in the book, obviously, but uh, I I am fascinated by junk science. Uh, junk science is when uh, people in a criminal case, it could be in a non-criminal case, put a witness on the stand who purports to be an expert, but is talking about an area that they that it's, it's nonsense, or maybe not complete nonsense, but not scientifically proven. And the Oregon Criminal Defense Lawyer Association, a fabulous organization in Oregon, uh, and they put on great seminars. They had a junk science seminar for two days that I, that I went to about two or three years ago. And they got into the shaken baby syndrome. And so I have Robin, uh, it's very controversial, whether it's, it's the real deal or not. So I have Robin representing a woman who's charged with uh, assaulting her, her little baby. <clears throat> uh, and there's no signs of, no visible external signs of injury, no you know, cracked head or bruises on the shoulders or you know, someone punched in the chest. But there are internal injuries, and uh, uh, this is used as the basis for prosecuting people, women usually, who have uh, uh, children with serious injuries, but no external ones. And so I give both sides of that argument in the, in the trial. I have a lengthy trial where uh, the, the charge is, uh, the government's charge is based on proving uh, through the shaken baby syndrome that this woman's guilty. So that that's one of the things that I have uh, going in there that I really uh, uh, did a lot, that, that I did a ton of research. I 
I talked to, you know, experts in the area and read books about it and articles and everything. So that was a lot of fun, but I won't tell the plot of the book at all. All right. And it's a good one. All right. I guess we should uh, check with John and see if we have any questions. We do. Um, so Trisha wants to know, she says she's always been intrigued by male or female authors who can write a continuing opposite gender. How did you find the voice for Robin and why did you decide on a Robin and not a Robert? Oh, okay. So this is a funny story. So the first book I got published, I was in my mid thirties, uh, was Hearthstone and uh, uh, it had a male main character. And uh, the editor at, uh, at Pocket Books asked me if I would be willing to write a series for Pocket Books with a female prosecutor. And I just panicked. I said, hey, I can't do that. I, I couldn't write a woman. I, I don't know how to do that. And so uh, I passed on it. I, I then wrote a second book, The Last Thing is a Man with a Male, uh, male in it. So then 12 years later, I had a big gap because of my, my practice got exciting and I started to write Gom and I've forgotten. I had a dinner, uh, uh, we had a dinner party at my house. I got this idea for a third book after talking to one of the guests and I thought, hey, it'll be fun to write a third book. So I, I decided I would have the, invent the worst human being who ever lived. And it's by Martin Darius, who's a serial killer. And the first scene where the male main character meets Martin is in this high rise office building late at night when only the cleaning crews are around. And I'm, I have represented serial killers and <clears throat> I represent a lot of people who've killed people. And when you're in a contact visiting room with somebody who's actually murdered someone, your antenna's up a little bit, but if it's a serial killer who kills women, you know you're not the guy's type, so you're not as nervous as you might be. So I'm thinking, you know, the tension level in this scene is pretty low. You know, David Nash, who was, he was the main character in Last Innocent Man, I decided to bring him forward. I said, he's not going to be that nervous. But then I thought, now, what Darius is accused of doing is killing the, the wives of prominent businessmen. And I said, and he dehumanizes the women before he kills them. So I thought, well, if it was a woman in the room in the middle of the night with nobody else in this high rise, the tension level would be through the roof. So I got really scared and I thought, well, I'm gonna have to change the sex of my main character to be a woman. And I thought, how am I gonna do that? Well, my first wife, Doreen, we had a wonderful 39 year marriage and she passed away in 2007. Uh, I've remarried have Melanie is just an exceptionally wonderful woman too. I've been very lucky, but Doreen was a lawyer. And I thought to myself, how am I going to do that? How am I going to do a woman character? And I said, well, who's the toughest guy I know? I said, it's Doreen. So what I did was I imagined my wife in every scene that Betsy Tannenbaum was in. And I said, what would do, how would she talk? How would she act? And I got over my fear of females by the end of the book and now uh, I would say that at least half of the books have very strong women characters in the leads, maybe even more. Yeah, I actually got to a point, it's really funny, where people uh, were accusing me of pandering to women because more women read, uh, you know, than men do. And I, I don't do that. I actually pick the character based on the plot. You know, who would be, if a man's better in the lead, then I do a man. If it's a woman, I do a woman but I'm no longer scared of, of women. So I got over my fear of women. So Keith, you asked Philip about this, but I wanna ask you, so who are some of your favorite authors and what have you read lately that you love? Oh, see, here's the problem. Years ago, Michael Peach was on a panel I did at BoucherCon and I asked mm -hmm. him this question. He said, one of the things you give up as an editor when you're in this business is the right to a, a uh, personal reading life because what you read is manuscripts. And so I will tell you that the number of things I've read over the last year have always been strange things have been sitting th on my floor for decades. Um, and I'm not kidding. I actually literally am in the middle of reading a book I bought in 1982 and been meaning to get to for 40 years. So far, not bad. Um, but, you know, uh, let me think. One of favorite authors, 
I've got some obscure ones from my uh, that no one's ever heard of and nothing's in, in print, but there was a science fiction writer named Edgar Pangborn that I loved when I was a teenager. And he wrote a half a dozen novels, uh, dystopian future novels. Um, and uh, other writers that I, I, I love a lot would be, um, let me think, you know, trying to not name people that I did publish and do publish is always a problem. Um, <laughs> Stephen Hunter, I actually liked those two novels that you mentioned a lot of people that I published in the past that are no longer with us. Bill Tapley was always one of my favorite mystery writers. He had this brilliant sense of place that he always brought and humanity that he brought to his characters. And I read him before I published him and I published him then later up until he died. Um, then, um, and along the same lines, uh, I think Archer Mayer sort of fills the same sort of uh, void of crime writers. Um, I actually did read a, uh, an Ellery Queen novel last week um, and that was one of his early ones. And the funny thing is the implication at the end is the person he just got off actually did kill the person, but he never states it directly. And that's Howling Dog. And it's the uh, playing fun with the old, uh, you know, dogs that howl in the night uh, thing of, uh, of Arthur Conan Doyle. So when you're when you when you do get the chance to pick up something to read for pleasure, are you able to turn the the editor brain off, or are you still very like, oh, I would do it this way or this way? Ninety nine percent of the time, it's easy to turn the editor brain off and just let it go. Occasionally, you run into something where you're like, this is such a mess. I can't believe somebody <laughs> let this go. But uh, uh, no, for the most part, if it's printed between covers, I I just read along. And how about you, Philip? As you're, you know, reading for pleasure, are you able to kind of turn off the writer brain and get into something? You know, one of the great things I, I can do is if you're a criminal defense lawyer, you're handling a lot of cases at the same time, and so you really need to be able to compartmentalize. So um, I read two to three books a week, and I have a book with me all the time. Uh, I read during coffee breaks. So I'll be working on a book, and then if I take a coffee break or lunch, I'll be reading someone else's book. And I, I never think, I never ever do like editing stuff. I don't, you know, I just read for fun. I don't, you know, read critically when I'm reading stuff. So, um, you know, I could, <clears throat> I could be reading the book and then go right back and work on my book, and then, you know read a news article, whatever. And it, uh, when I'm doing the writing, I'm not thinking about the book. When I'm reading the book, I'm not thinking about the writing. Great. Uh, so we've got a couple good questions from Arlene. She wants to know, Philip, have you have you received uh, reader comments that have stayed with you outside of what you would see from like an editor or a publication? So just reader comments. Or, are there any that have just like stuck with you? Yes. My two favorite comments ever were, uh, a one-star review on Amazon that said that my book was so bad, the guy's cat could have written it. I've been trying to find a cat for years. <laughs> if someone knows where that cat is, because I could have the cat write my books and I could play golf, but that, they, so far I haven't found the cat. And then my other favorite one was uh, a fan, this was before email. This woman said, I, I read your book, I bought your book at the bookstore because the, the, the clerk swore that the words God and damn were not used in the same sentence. And then on page 52, I, I found those two words together and I threw your book in the trash where it belongs. So those are my two favorite reader comments. Awesome. And so I, I love to get really great comments where they say I'm like the greatest writer ever, but you know, again, being a lawyer, you can't love the good ones and then get mad at the bad ones. So I, it's nice that people like the book. I always, that's why I write to have, you know, people have fun with the book, but I never take the bad ones that seriously. And, or unless they do have, sometimes they make really good points. So then I will, you know, I'll, I'll take them to heart and try to, you know, uh, you know, change what I did, but, but, 
Uh, so Arlene also wants to know, what's the most inspiring part of your writing process and what is the most challenging? Okay, so the, the most exciting is also the most challenging and that's getting an idea that is, I mean, this is the thing, I always get terrified when I finish a book. Am I gonna be able to figure out an idea? Like I said, ideas are teeny weeny, books are huge and I always get really nervous. Am I gonna be able to get an idea that will be big enough to fill up a whole book? Um, so that, that for me is the single, writing for me is really easy. I've never had a problem. Once I get that idea, I work through an outline and then I get the, you know, I don't know if I mentioned, I will not write a single word unless I've got the ending. So for me, the ending is the most important part. So what I do is I get my idea, I think about it. I don't, I always tell new writers, don't write, think. So if you get an idea, do not rush out and write. Just think about the idea, develop it. And then once I get the ending, who did it and how are they going to get caught? Uh, and I can change that. It's my book, but I have to have an end point. Then I do a very extensive outline that takes about one to three months. Uh, they usually end up being about 25 pages and I talk my way through. So once I've got that idea and I've got the ending, it's a snap. I have no problem whatsoever sitting down and writing. And I love it. I really enjoy being creative. Uh, but it's getting that initial idea that for me is the big challenge uh, and and then developing the ideas is is the, the hard part. But the writing is, for me is a snap. It's not difficult at all. Awesome. Um, so Trisha wants to know, and I kind of have a sort of question to go with this too. So since you have such a background in law, how much additional research do you feel you need to do? And also how do you feel that legal thrillers have kind of changed since you started writing them? Yeah, I don't read a lot of legal thrillers. It's sort of funny. Uh, I, I tend more to action, you know, series or mysteries and stuff. So uh, I don't I don't read a lot, and I don't watch any lawyer shows on television because I they tend to be very silly, and I just <laughs> I, I said oh, okay, you know, they're like science fiction. Um, the 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 research uh, that I do now, there's some stuff I don't need to research how to do a trial. I did hundreds of trials and I don't need to research what it's like to go up to a jail or to you know interview a client all that stuff is just like what I did on a daily basis uh, but usually I have something in each book that requires a lot of research like the third victim I did a lot of research I attended seminars and read articles about Alzheimer's uh, for the book that that is the next one in the Robin Lockwood uh, series, uh, The Darkest Place. I had to do a lot of research on Shaken Baby. Uh, my first book, Heartstone, I had to figure out if you found a pair of glasses at a crime scene, could you trace them to a person like you could with fingerprints? Uh, I've done neutron activation analysis, which I actually used in an attempted murder case. That's where you put stuff into an attempt atomic reactor, nuclear reactor, and you, you find out what the elements are. So I've used that in, um, in a book, and I also use it in a trial. So for me, the most fun that I had when, as a lawyer was researching unusual stuff. Like I had to learn all about um, the Mian tribe in, in northern Laos and southern China for one of my uh, uh, battered women cases. So. I do huge amounts of research on the stuff that's not, that doesn't have to do with being a lawyer, uh, very little on being a lawyer, because that's like what I do. Awesome. So thank you. Thank you again. So to recap this evening, we've been chatting with Philip Margolin, whose newest book in the Robin Lockwood series, A Matter of Life and Death, just came out. And um, a big thank you to Keith Kayla, his editor, for leading the Q&A with us. One thing I wanted to mention that I did not when we got started is uh, Keith pointed out beforehand, he's wearing one of our Murder by the Book bonfire campaign t-shirts. I also have one of mine on as well. We have just relaunched a new campaign with our famous detective shirts. So I'm going to drop a link to that in the comments. Um, the campaign runs. Yeah, show the shirt.
So there's his, I've got the anniversary one. So we're doing another another campaign for them with our Famous Detectives logo on it, um, running through April 4th. So that way, if you order them, they will be in stock before Independent Bookstore Day. So those are there, go order them. The baseball shirts are the most comfortable thing you have ever put on. Like I'm gonna order like another five of them now that we've relaunched the campaign. Um, and we have copies of all of uh, the books in the Robin Lockwood series in stock now. So if you guys have not ordered, you can come visit us in store. We're open again for in-store browsing. Of course, masks are required, even though the governor has lifted our mask mandate. We're still asking that you mask up when you come in the store. Um, we're also available at murderbooks.com. And if you missed any part of our chat, you will be able to rewatch it on Facebook and YouTube when we're done. Sometimes YouTube takes just a little bit longer to archive it because it's got to do some extra encoding. But they will be up uh, to watch again if you missed any part of it, as well as our other um, hundreds of author interviews that we have done in the last year. Again, Philip, Keith, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been great to chat with you. Take care. Don't take care. Thanks.